Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matthew Keenan, and I'm a partner at Chicardi and Bacon in Kansas City, and I also have the privilege of serving on Legal Services Board of Directors. I want to join with Nicole and express, I think, speak on behalf of everybody and express our appreciation, Dr. Begay and Stephanie and Rudy, Anthony and Nicole, for that excellent briefing and all you have done uh, to deliver legal services to the indigenous communities during this difficult time. <clears throat> Um, we have a new panel, and this panel represents business leaders from some of our country's most prominent companies, and they will discuss and describe how the business community has taken an active role in increasing access to justice. Uh, these individuals also serve on Legal Services Corporation's Leaders Council, where they work to promote LSC's important mission and various access to justice initiatives. Um, so I want to introduce these leaders to you and also note that they have also distinguished themselves in this important fight for access to justice that we're here discussing today. <clears throat> First panelist is Kate Adams. She is the Senior Vice President of Legal and Global Security and General Counsel of Apple. Previously, she served as General Counsel and Senior Vice President of Honeywell. Ivan Fong is the Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary of 3M. Previously, Ivan served as General Counsel for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the Chief Legal Officer and Secretary for Cardinal Health. Bill Newcomb is the Founder and CEO of the World Justice Project. He's a retired partner of the international law firm KNL Gates and is a lecturer at Stanford Law School. He previously served as executive vice president, general counsel, and chief legal officer for the Microsoft Corporation. Laura Stein is the executive vice president, general counsel, and corporate affairs at the Clorox Company. She previously served as senior vice president of the H.J. Hines Company. And finally, Teresa Wynn Roseboro, Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary for the Home Depot. She previously held positions in the legal department of MetLife and was a partner in the law firm that is now Eversheds Sutherland. And finally, I want to introduce today's moderator, a dear friend of mine, LSC's President Ron Flagg. Prior to his time, at LSC, Ron was a partner of Sidley and Austin, where he practiced commercial and administrative litigation for more than 30 years. He currently serves as the chair of the District of Columbia's Bar Pro Bono Task Force and as the board chair of the National Veterans Legal Services Program. Ron, you have the floor. Thanks, Matt. And uh... Thank you to all of our panelists for joining us, which leads me to my first question. Teresa, we've got a, a large number of stellar business leaders today. And from your perspective, why does the business community have a significant interest in justice and the rule of law? Why are you here today? Thanks for having me today, Ron, and thanks for allowing me to be a panelist with so many other distinguished leaders in our profession. and. Thanks to all of you for um, all that you're doing in this time of crisis in our country. And I also want to uh, thank the uh, members of the prior presentation and panelists. I learned so much from your presentations and uh, look forward to opportunities perhaps to work more closely with you on helping to find uh, solutions. But very impressed in all you're doing and thank you for what you're doing. And why do, why do corporations care <laughs> about what you're doing, about what LSC does? And I thought um, rather than do a complete laundry list, I'll just try to point to four things. One, we as companies are creatures of law ourselves. We're wholly formed and we exist because of law, but law does form us into citizens. So we care just like every heartbeat citizen uh, should care about the quality and health of our democracy. And that includes the instruments of that democracy, in particular, the quality and health of the justice system. The second thing is the importance of public trust to the effectiveness of our businesses. We are entities that can sue and be sued. And the public perception of the quality of our judicial system has everything to do with our ability to have those disputes resolved in a way 
that has finality, uh, that allows everybody to walk away uh, believing that they've had fair witness and fair hearing uh, by a competent authority, and with our ability to continue to do business effectively with our counterparties, whether those are other corporations or um, individuals, is the direct result of trust and confidence in that system and its transparency and availability to all. The third thing is that we as corporations are ourselves composed of citizens. And those individuals upon whom we rely have in their lives have to depend on the instruments of justice. And they have fundamental needs to, to housing, to fairness and consumer transactions and lending transactions in order to make their lives work so that they can be effective parts of the Home Depot. And I thought I'd tell two quick stories about how intertwined we are with the needs of the individuals. Um, the first story I'd highlight is that uh, a young woman came to us um, through one of the pro bono programs we support asking us for assistance in expunging her prior criminal record so that she could go to nursing school. She was serving as a nursing assistant, had been doing so for over 10 years, and uh, had applied to nursing school and been rebuffed because of minor uh, drug violations in her early 20s. We worked to get her records expunged and then helped her with her process of being applying to nursing school. We then learned that she had been serving for the past five years as a nursing assistant for a Home Depot associate who had been rendered paraplegic when he fell off a ladder in one of our stores. He cited her as one of the reasons that he was able to function as effectively as he did. And it was a relationship that we didn't know about at the time that we uh, lent our help to her to help her expunge her record. But as it turned out, her ability to lead a quality life, to pursue education, uh, and to uh, participate in society was directly responsible for the care of a, a Home Depot associate who had been tragically injured. The second story I would tell is, is a lot more uh, recent. We had a young associate, a cashier in one of our stores, who was walking home from work um, in Omaha, Nebraska, and uh, took a bus home from the store. Uh, it was during curfew, but she was armed with a letter from her store informing them that she had been at work and that she was traveling home from work. And she was um, let off from, by her bus four blocks from her home and told that they couldn't let her off at her usual stop and that she had to walk the rest of the way. And she got about halfway home when she was stopped by the police, interrogated, and arrested. She showed them that the letter she had, the letter had a phone number to call for additional information or to verify her identity. Uh, the police de declined to call that letter, uh, took her to jail, um, and she spent the night in jail. She, we didn't know about her whereabouts until afternoon the next day when a public service organization uh, paid her, her bail uh, and she was allowed to go home. In our interactions with the police and with the mayor of the city on her behalf, we became intricately concerned about the quality of policing in that community, about the impact of that policing on our associates, about her right to access to counsel and to have a, had the right to inform a family member of where she was uh, when she was taken off the street on the way from home for work, after working for us uh, while working for the Home Depot. And as I told the mayor of that city, when you arrested her, you arrested the 400,000 uh, associates of the Home Depot as well. And so we care deeply about how the justice system impacts the associates that work for us. The last thing I would say, probably maybe more to the expected heartbeat of corporate America and our interest in shareholder value is that inequality has a direct impact on the quality of our economy. By one estimate, racial inequity alone costs our economy over $1 trillion. If we can use the legal system to help close the gaps in our economy, close the gaps in access to justice, close the gaps in access to basic human needs and rights, we can also make our economy run better and more effectively, and that ultimately went on near to the benefit of our associates and shareholders. So those are just four of the reasons that we care uh, deeply. There are many, many more, 
Uh, but ultimately, we are all united in the cause of making this democracy work and making the judicial system work for all is an important part of that. Thanks, Teresa. And your remarks really underscore how important access to justice is to the country as a whole, but also how in individual cases, these, these are really bad company cases, the uh, uh, individual cases you talked about uh, couldn't have been more important to those people and their families. So thank you for sharing those. Bill, before I go any further, let me congratulate you on having just uh, been awarded the ABA's highest uh, award, the ABA medal. So uh, we're happy to thank have you, you uh, fresh off of that. Thank you. Uh, Bill, the business community has not always been a part of the rule of law conversation. Could you talk about when and how the shift started? And uh, also, as you're telling us about that, please tell us about the World Justice Project, which you founded. Uh, first of all, let me add to John, um, John's remarks about beginning with that stunning statistic about the number of folks, low income folks in this country who have virtually no meaningful access to civil justice, 86% and probably rising. I think the National Opinion Research Center did that work for LSC in 2017. They're a part of the University of Chicago, a redoubtable um, data gathering organization. You have to believe in their numbers. There's another number that we have discovered in the course of our indexing at the World Justice Project, and that is that of the 120 plus countries where we measure access to the rule of law, the United States ranks in the bottom 10% for the amount of discrimination that exists in our civil justice system in this country. Stop and think about that for a minute. We are one of the worst performing countries in the world in terms of how much discrimination we permit, we tolerate in our access to civil justice and our civil justice system in this country. Put those two statistics together and you're reminded of how dire the mission is of the Legal Services Corporation. Let me take one more minute also, if I may, Ron, just to connect the concept of the rule of law with the concept of access to civil justice. The rule of law is a capacious concept, as wiser people than I have often said, and we use it during the ABA annual meeting the last few days. I've probably heard the term used 50 to 100 times, and rarely do we pause to define the term. Let me suggest or invite you to have a look at our definition, which we've been working on for 12 years since our founding back in 07, and our definition is pretty straightforward, but importantly for today, it features access to justice as one of its four pillars. We think of the rule of law as a system, a durable system, composed of laws, institutions, norms, and community commitment to four universal principles. The first is accountability of public and private actors under a set of just laws. Those just laws include public safety laws, property laws, and maybe most importantly, a core of human rights laws. Thirdly, a system of open government so that the governed can know how people are making the laws, the rules, the regulations, the community norms even in more informal systems. They can know how they're being administered. Most people come in contact with the law in administrative ways, not in litigation or legislation. And finally, how it is those laws, rules, regulations, or norms are enforced by military, by police, by prosecutors, by courts. And finally, and, mo and maybe most importantly for today, the, the notion of a system of accessible, impartial dispute resolution. Whether it be formal of the sort that we're, we typically use in this country, or whether it be informal, which is the mechanism for resolving disputes in so many countries and so, so for, for so many human beings around the world. A, concept of the suit resolution that we may not pay quite enough attention to in this country, it seems to me. So when we talk about the rule of law, we are talking about human rights. We're talking about accountability. We're talking about 
just laws, open government. We're talking emphatically and explicitly about access to justice. How do people participate in civil justice? How do they participate in criminal justice systems? And in terms of when business became aware of the meaning and the importance of the rule of law, I think some of it goes back a few decades. Um, I think my experience at Microsoft was that in the 80s and 90s, we were increasingly aware that our market was not just in the US. The majority of our revenues were coming from offshore, initially from more mature economies in more developed countries. But over time, we are increasingly aware of the fact that opportunities for growth came from less mature economies in developing countries. And when you're doing business in those kinds of markets in those countries, you want to know whether a deal is a deal, whether you have an independent, competent judiciary or some means of resolving disputes. You want to know what the government's role is. You want to know how, how free from, uh, from duress and from other unfortunate interventions the government is in its daily operations. That's when data about rule of law compliance became, I think, increasingly important to American-based multinational corporations. I, I certainly think that the recession in 08 knocked us all back on our heels and made us sort of revisit the question of how business is being done in this country. And I think more recently, just before the pandemic, we saw a refreshed conversation about corporate social responsibility. It's always been a part of the discussion, I think, in public and private companies in this country, but I think it came to a moment, perhaps that business roundtable discussion and the statement made by those CEOs, but I think it is even in these times of a pandemic and an economic recession and, and the ugly reality of systemic racism in this country, I think it is still very much a powerful topic for discussion. And I think it's unresolved as to whether the CSR movement is a moment or whether it really can be a movement. And if so, what can powerful wealthy corporations, what can and should they do more broadly than advance the rights and interests of their shareholders? It's sort of a Chicago school and a Cambridge school as you all know about the obligations of for-profit companies. But I think right in the middle of that is the rule of law and right in the middle of that therefore has to be a corporation's opportunity or perhaps even obligation to make sure that people of low income in whatever communities that company does business, they have access to a competent civil justice system so they can resolve disputes. One more correlation we have discovered at the World Justice Project is that folk with unresolved legal problems have lessened health than folks who do not. The stress of an unresolved legal problem is real and it bears on the physical and mental health of people who are denied that access. So chew on that for a little bit, if you will. So I think today we're in a, we're in a very, critical time for the analysis and commitments of the business community to the broad concept of the rule of law, but perhaps most importantly, at least for today's discussion, the, con the notion of what it is that companies, again, have the opportunity. They certainly have the opportunity because they have the resources to do something about it and what is their obligation to do something about making more justice available to more folks, not just in this country, but starting here, surely, but also, excuse me, also in, in other countries. And the things that companies can do, Teresa's already, I think, hit the nail on the head four or five times, and the other experts to follow will do a better job of this. But what occurs immediately to me, Ron, in closing is the law department's are full of such talented, dynamic lawyers these days. This is not your grandfather's law department, if you will, that they can certainly use their resources and their imagination and their critical thinking to find ways to bring more civil justice to more people 
in this and other countries, whether it's a pro bono program in-house, whether it's encouraging outside law firms to have pro bono programs, certainly the diversity movement has benefited from that. Corporations making demands on their outside counsel to be Rio D and I engines. I also think that it's time for more brainstorming, whether by law firms or emphatically, I think by law departments, what kind of new models of delivery can we think about? Are there lessons to be learned from the informal systems? Do our solutions always have to be so lawyer centric? Think about it. What can we do to have ways of resolving disputes where the loser can go about her work and her life thinking she's had her day in court without having had to go to court? So many people in this globe go to a shaman or an elder and he, unfortunately, too often he decides a matter based on the norms in that community. And the enforceability is built in because the community won't stand for the person who has lost not to perform according to the decisions by that wise person. Are there elder opportunities for us in this and other developed countries to think about this? Bill has, has teed up a number of good questions, but uh, one of them is this, the U.S. is standing in the... Uh, world justice community uh, uh, suffers because of what we refer to as the justice gap here, the gap between legal needs of people living in poverty and the resources currently available to meet those needs. How can the business community take a, a leading role in closing the justice gap and, and what have you tried at 3M to do that? Thank you very much, uh, Ron, uh, for not only this question, but to the LSC for it me and this panel to speak on, on this critical topic. Um, you know, I would describe it less as a gap but more as a chasm. Um, our current justice system uh, simply fails low-income people. Uh, as you heard uh, earlier in this program, you know, the, the percentage of uh, legal needs that are unmet, the fact that most civil litigants in the state court are not represented. Um, as a result, you know, corporations really have a stake and a, and a deep interest in uh, our administration of justice. And I would argue an obligation to strengthen uh, our system of justice. Uh, because when people lose faith in our system, if people don't think uh, they can get a fair shake or uh, or if they'll uh, face a level playing field, um, it undermines the foundation of our democracy. Uh, and as Teresa said, that erodes credibility and trust uh, on which uh, businesses need uh, to uh, perform and to grow and to hire and um, sell products and services um, in a functioning economy. Uh, so, so it's really uh, critical to a company to uh, the expression of its values. What, what are the things that are important? Um, uh, Bill mentioned uh, corporate social responsibility, and I think you know, that takes the form of perhaps three different ways, or at least three different ways. Uh, first is through dollars. Um, our uh, legal budget contains a line for uh, support for uh, uh, access to justice uh, efforts. Um, our 3M Foundation also partners with us in, in directing uh, charitable uh, contributions to organizations like Equal Justice Works, uh, Southern Minnesota Regional Legal Services, uh, the Children's Law Center, uh, the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, uh, Neighborhood Justice Center, and, and many others. Um, a second uh, uh, lever is, is influence. Uh, the, the bully pulpit that corporations have uh, globally um, is, is powerful. Um, it's an opportunity to model good corporate citizenship, uh, social responsibility. Companies can inspire others, can motivate, uh, mobilize uh, others, and convene other leaders, uh, whether it's in response to George Floyd's uh, tragic uh, killing, uh, whether it's uh, to advocate for police reforms, uh, 
uh, numbers of dozens, if not more, uh, general counsel have signed letters of support uh, to Congress uh, in favor of full funding of the Legal Services Corporation. There are many, many avenues uh, for companies to uh, express support. And then third, uh, the support for pro bono, uh, not only within our legal departments, but, but in general, I think is a key factor. Um, you know, we, um, like many other law departments, have a very active pro bono program. Uh, we have uh, represented uh, individuals in expungement cases. We do housing and eviction cases. Uh, we do refugee immigration cases. We uh, represent veterans uh, with their legal issues. Uh, I've done adoption and foster child uh, cases. Um, we are expanding our program into our international colleagues. There is a great hunger and interest uh, globally for how lawyers can improve access to justice and improve the administration of justice. Um, every year we publish a report uh, summarizing some of the highlights of our pro bono work. Um, in 2019, uh, over 100 of our lawyers and their legals um, devoted uh, over 2,500 hours, not including community service efforts, uh, such as Habitat for Humanity and other non-legal forms of, uh, of pro bono legal services. So there's a lot to do. There's a lot companies can do. Um, I'm optimistic that, uh, you know, we have a new opportunity with, with the crises that we're going through, whether it's COVID, whether it's the economic um, uh, uh, recession or depression that we're um, in the midst of and, and the um, racial justice and social justice uh, crises that we're facing. I think there are great opportunities for companies to be leaders uh, in, in this effort. So thank you, Rob. Thanks so much, Ivan. Uh, Laura, one of the ways in which uh, corporate America can help is obviously pro bono. And I think all of our speakers have, have talked about that. And you're not only a leader at Clorox, but uh, in our profession in promoting uh, pro bono work um, uh, by both people in corporate uh, offices as well as in law firms. Um, You've played a key role in developing a robust pro bono practice at, at Clorox. What, why is it important that uh, your attorneys do pro bono work? And to get to a, a nittier, grittier question, how do you address the concerns of your corporate attorneys who want to help but are nervous about taking cases outside their area of expertise? Hey, um, Ron, thank you so much uh, for including me. And uh, it's so great to see the faces of so many people I care so much about. Um, and it just uh, is, is really inspiring to be part of this important event. And just a huge thanks to the Legal Services Corporation for everything uh, that you do that makes such a difference. Um, so Ron, you asked about, you know, why pro bono? You know, I'm really proud of the work that lawyers to do communities in, in desperate need, especially with COVID uh, uh, impact on, on the most vulnerable among to support the migrant and racial justice and so much more. Um, and the reason uh, we do this is, is um, you know, there's the key and most important reason for us is it's so tantamount to our core value, which is do the right thing. And it's the right thing to support uh, uh, people who do not have access to justice. And it makes our society and our democracy so much stronger when there is fairness, when there is justice, and when there is equality. Um, you know, from our company standpoint, you know, we're very uh, focused on our corporate citizenship and our uh, ESG, if you will, and how we 
as an overall organization can support our communities and be a great citizen in the communities we're part of. And our pro bono practice is, is part of that work. So it's very tied uh, by the, with the legal team into what our overall purpose of our, our company is. At Clorox, and I know so many of you on this phone and, and on this uh, Zoom, that lawyers have an obligation to give back, to do pro bono. It's part of the privilege of practicing law. You know, lawyers have a special role in society uh, to, to drive justice, to protect access to justice and equality. And we need to be um, doing pro bono to help meet our obligation as lawyers to bring about a more just society. Um, another reason, you know, why there's so much passion um, in my team for doing pro bono is the need is so great. Uh, we've already uh, heard my uh, this important program, and it's only been made more challenging and the need is greater with the impact of the pandemic, uh, the looming recession, and uh, the need for uh, systemic uh, uh, racial justice. And so, you know, what already was a, a very vulnerable situation for so many uh, people in need in our uh, country has just become uh, even that much more so. Um, so I think one reason why people do pro bono is they know that it makes a difference and it's needed uh, to bring about uh, a more just society. And then a real critical reason for our team for doing this engages us. It's the purpose of why so many people went to law school. And so being able to do pro bono to work in access just fuels people's passion. It, it's a real uh, source of team building. It, it helps with our recruiting and our, our attention. Um, kind of how it, it, it just it makes our team so much more connected. You know, when the news came out about, uh, you know, how much more pro bono need there is following COVID and, and recent events, and then also the fact that so many law students lost their summer internships um, because of shelter in place and, and the pandemic, you know, lawyers on my team talked about could we do something to increase pro bono and help law students who lost their, their jobs with such a future lawyer's career and could we do something. So we actually ended up taking on five times the amount of summer and made them pro bono um, uh, internships where they did do some Clorox legal work with attorneys, but also part of the uh, pro bono. And just the excitement of being around law students who really want to bring about a better world to do pro bono just made everyone feel that much happier uh, in our team. We finally, we care so much about encouraging our outside counsel and other partners to reflect our values and do pro bono. So we know if we do pro bono, it'll have a, a larger impact. And then Ron, you asked, uh, uh, you know, what about people who uh, you might not have training in the area of, uh, uh, as a, a non-litigator, you know, I've been in, in court representing domestic violent survivors and others, and, and it does take a village and a lot of training to have, uh, have folks like me be in, be in court. Um, but I think the reason why uh, our, our lawyers and so many of uh, lawyers around the country want to be on is they know that they are training um, so that they'll be trained and supported as uh, they make a difference when the need is so great. So thank you so much. Thanks, Laura. I would say any uh, client, whether it's domestic violence or a, a transaction client, would be well served to have you as their lawyer. And we're lucky to have you with us okay. today. Uh, 
I'm not sure that uh, Kate Adams is still with us. Kate and I were partners at Sidley for many years, uh, uh, and it's great to see you, Kate. So um, Apple's made a commitment to help solve the affordable housing crisis in the San Francisco area. Talk about a big issue to try to take on. Could you tell us about the project and, and uh, Apple's role in it? Yeah, I'd love to talk about this. And before I do that, I want to just say hi to my friends, um, the fellow GCs and former GCs and John, another Sidley partner. Um, and I'm really grateful to be able to be here and talk to all of you a little bit about the work we're going to be doing or are doing in the Silicon Valley area on housing. And you know, I think um, those of you that are not familiar with the challenge of housing in, in this particular part of the world, though, I think it's a reflection of, uh, you know, a, a phenomenon that occurs in a lot of places, but it's especially acute here in, in California, um, and particularly in the Bay Area. Um, and it's, it's really a reflection of the um, income distribution change that we've seen throughout our society and uh, the wealth gap um, playing itself out in terms of access to affordable housing. And there's a variety of reasons, historic, why the Bay Area doesn't have as much um, uh, moderately priced housing as one would like. And that one could write a long his history or treatise on that subject. But the bottom line is that is the situation. And what it's doing is it's forcing, um, it's basically deintegrating to the extent we had diverse communities. And it's also hollowing out um, the, you know, the richness of, of the um, towns and cities in the Bay Area, because folks that are doing jobs like teaching, um, law enforcement, sanitation, um, even, even entry level tech jobs or entry level um, business jobs can't afford to buy a really anything and may not even be able to afford rent in a, in a modest rental unit. And that problem has, has been exacerbated every single year over the last 20 years as the tech boom has, has continued <laughs> apace, notwithstanding, even now, uh, notwithstanding um, recent events and other challenges in the economy. So, you know, we felt as Apple that we had an obligation to tackle this um, in a comprehensive way. And, and by the way, not, one company, no matter how much money you put into it, is not going to is not going to solve this. It's it's a step to try to galvanize or be part of a collective effort that has to be community based, um, government um, government programs and support and business uh, support. And so we we decided to go after basically four areas um, with a two point five billion dollar commitment for housing in, in, particularly in the Bay Area, but California in general. Um, so a billion of the dollars are intended to co-invest in actual affordable housing itself, because there just simply isn't enough of it. And without the housing stock, you really don't, <laughs> you don't have much to work with. Um, uh, the, the, another billion is gonna go to first time home buyer mortgage assistance, because housing prices are so high that, uh, average middle income families or and lower income families for certain just can't afford a down payment. Um, and so we're going to be partnering with various uh, lenders to backstop lending programs that will reach more uh, moderate and lower income home buyers, first time home buyers. Um, and we're particularly interested in supporting members of the community like teachers and firefighters and so forth that are um, critical parts of the infrastructure and fabric of a functioning society, but are being um, increasingly unable to stay and work, um, stay in the communities and live in the communities where they work. And so it almost becomes a commuter service job as opposed to your neighborhood teacher, your neighborhood firefighter, your neighborhood beat cop. Um, uh, then two other components were going to be making Apple owned land available for, um, for affordable housing. And, um, and, and so they're just, we have certain properties that are well situated um, and we're trying to uh, break through some of the um, challenges of zoning and um, 
the, the usual issues when you're creating a mixed income housing situation by offering our own property for development. Um, and then we want to support vulnerable populations, in particular the homeless. And the pandemic has really created a spike in um, the homeless populations in the Bay Area that's much, much more visible. Um, and it was always bad, but it is extremely visible. Right now, you really see many people losing their housing, notwithstanding some of the legal support for um, for tenants. And so we're going to be um, putting $50 million into support for the homeless. Uh, and that's my five minutes. And so that's a snapshot of what we're doing. Thanks, Kate. That's terrific. Uh, Bill, uh, we obviously need innovations uh, to if we're going to uh, make a dent in the justice gap and improving access to justice in America. You re recently authored uh, a piece in the, an op-ed in the Seattle Times about limited licensed legal technician program that uh, the state Supreme Court ended in Washington recently. Uh, could you tell us uh, briefly about the program and, and why you advocate for it to continue? Thank you. Um... And as usual, uh, on any panel I've been a member of, I've learned more than I have taught, I think. So thanks to those heroes of mine who are on this panel for what you said today and all the stuff you do day to day to make the system work better for more people. The Triple LT program in this state was, is not unique. It is in a variation on it. it, exists, I think, now in eight other states. But it's an example of that kind of creative, alternative way to serve people of low income with competent services in certain areas of law. And unfortunately, it appears as though the State Bar Association, which is a mandatory association, found it to be too expensive. And the Supreme Court, in an unbelievable move, had a private hearing on the topic, no notice to the public, and decided in its wisdom by a majority vote to terminate the program, a program which by all measurements seemed to be helping in a significant way. It's not over yet. and <laughs> We think the court's gonna have to take this back up again. The sitting chief justice in the immediate past voted against the, the uh, defunding of the program. But again, it's an example of a non-lawyer centric solution, partial solution to this problem. And it's just, a, it's very upsetting to Washington state lawyers and should be to lawyers across the country. I can't resist a grace note, if I may, Ron. What's also emerged from this was the narrow-mindedness of our state uh, bar association. We are mandatory. And I re realized for the first time that Washington, pardon me, California now has an organization called the California Lawyers Association. It is purely volunteer. And like most local organizations and the ABA, it means that it could be more bold and imaginative in the positions that it takes. And I wonder whether there isn't some movement towards having more volunteer statewide bar associations across this country because of the reality that mandatory bars tend to be very narrow in their agendas and pretty narrow-minded about some of the projects and positions they take. So look for that. If, if, California, if it's happening in California, and Lauren, Kate, you may have an insight on this that's, that I don't have, but if it's happening in California, I sense some discontent in this state with our state bar association and its narrow-mindedness. And I think it may be happening in more and more states, and I would consider that to be a good, a good and progressive movement. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Uh, okay, we've got uh, literally three minutes uh, before our next speaker, Senator Sinema, is going to speak. So I'd like each of uh, our other four panelists to take about uh, 45 seconds, and we're going to drop your corporate responsibility statements into the chat so people can get more information, but talk about uh, how your companies are, uh, what sort of initiatives that you, your companies have taken and, and you know, how you view this moment in history as a chance to go forward. We'll, we'll start with Ivan. And again, if each of you could take about 45 seconds, which is 10 minutes uh, too little for each of you. 
Yeah, thank you, Ron. This is uh, uh, a full hour of a conversation, if not more. So 45 seconds, you know, 3N, like many companies, is doing many things. We are responding to the uh, heartbreaking, um, painful, uh, uh, frustrating uh, events of the day uh, with, uh, with two sort of large uh, efforts or initiatives. The first is internal, so uh, addressing systemic uh, barriers uh, within our company, uh, improving representation uh, within our company, uh, doing a lot more training and uh, facilitated conversations about anti-racism, uh, about um, um, the role and the history of racial inequity uh, in the United States and how that's led to uh, systemic and um, other forms of racism today. Um, and then secondly, of course, an external uh, set of efforts that involves uh, developing uh, the workforce, uh, particularly in the African-American Latino communities, uh, manufacturing career paths, uh, STEM education, skilled trades, up, up, upskilling, uh, supplier diversity. I mean, every company uh, these days uh, is doing a lot and, and I'm hopeful that the collective effort uh, does feel different now um, because of, uh, of the moment that we're in uh, and that it will be sustained uh, and that we will look back you know, years from now and, and see this as a turning point uh, in how companies are uh, thinking about and addressing systemic racism in our society. Thanks, Ivan. Kate? All right, 45 seconds, go. So, you know, we, we have tried, of course, as all companies have, to be better in this area. And uh, recent events, which I won't, um, don't need to <laughs> tell everybody about, have really galvanized the desire to make a, more of a difference and really capture the moment and the energy in our society around racial justice and equality. So we're focusing on three areas, education, economic equality, and criminal justice reform, all of which we think go to the core roots of the systemic racism that um, you know, we just simply have not been able to overcome so far. Uh, and as underlying those three um, focus areas are three key tenets, which um, are representation, inclusion, and then very importantly, accountability. And, and of the three tenets, accountability, we believe, is the most significant in that it is going to put on all of us as leaders and as participants in the Apple community a personal obligation to take on the mantle of these um, of the change we want to make, uh, and that's that's how we're talking about it. There's a, also 100 million dollars of an investment behind these um, these these initiatives and and the tenets that we are espousing, and we're you know really um, focused on trying to do things that we genuinely believe will make a difference as quickly as we possibly can. So there you go, 45 seconds. Done. That was good, Kate. Thanks, Laura. Tell us by Clorox. Great. Uh, you know, we too believe that we need to do more. In seven years, we stood against racism, inequality, and injustice. And now we think we just have to stand stronger for the Black community and to confront systemic racial injustice that have, have plagued our nation uh, for so long. And so what we're doing in our communities, we've got deep roots in at Oakland and Atlanta. And so we're really focused on supporting black businesses in our communities, engaging black youth who represent our future and accelerating the black community's access to justice and criminal justice reform. And we want to do that in a way that's more than uh, making donations, to have volunteer opportunities, et cetera. So, on the access to justice front, in very short order, we partnered with Equal Justice Work and some leading justice organizations with Georgia Justice Project, uh, fighting um, and looking into uh, fairness and probation. We've got uh, an NAACP in Atlanta, Equal Justice Work Fellow, about to start addressing uh, fairness in, in housing. 
we in Oakland are having a um, an Equal Justice Works fellow who will be focused with Ruth and Rebound on reentry when people leave the criminal justice system and making sure that there's not uh, discrimination against them. And we're in hopefully about to announce another Equal Justice Works uh, fellow with the Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights for Oakland. Um, and we're really excited and really focused on ways fellows. And then, as Ivan said, we're also really committed committed as a company to do more as well. And we're committed to several and so equality and justice. We're going to increase our spending with minority and women-owned businesses. We've, for many years, had uh, bias training uh, to, to disrupt and, and stop bias, and we're going to double our investment to address uh, unconscious bias and, and, and get better. And then we're also going to really materially increase our recruiting from underserved communities. And we want to be accountable, so we're, we're planning to share our progress on these important areas. And we're just trying to be a member of the community, trying to help um, with you know, what we all need to do. Thank you so much. Teresa, we started with you. You get the last word. Uh, well, thank you, um, Ron. Just to say, this has been a great moment in time for our um, country, particularly as an African-American. I felt a particular poignancy to the opportunity to the nation to come together uh, in a way that we have not collectively since the 1960s to fight against a systemic racism with much more urgency than we've done before. The Home Depot has spoken out uh, loudly against hate and one of the most immediate actions we took is we uh, relied on one of our core values since our founding, which has been respect for all people, to launch a respect for all people action page that allowed all of our associates to speak out in favor of, of hate crimes legislation in the four states that did not have hate crimes legislation. I'm proud to say that Georgia did immediately act and pass uh, hate crimes legislation we formed a task force on civil rights, uh, education, uh, enrichment, equality, um, economic inclusion and diversity, which we call CREED, which will guide the company's future actions and investments. We currently have about $30 million of investments in African American communities around the country. We're going to triple that um, investment, but a lot of our work will be internal. We have not done all that we can to promote diversity and inclusion within the walls of the Home Depot family. And we will be looking conscientiously at what we can do to expand our unconscious bias training to all associates uh, and to make sure that every associate in the Home Depot feels that they have the opportunity to participate fully in all of the opportunities that the Home Depot provides. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll, as a closing word, I just want to thank all of our panelists for being here today, but more importantly, for being the kind of leaders we're going to need to make equal access to justice in America, a reality. Thank you.